be live. Hello everyone, I'm Emily Joya. I'm the online program manager at the Edible School Year Project and I'm joined with, by Stacy Slate, our community manager. Thank you for joining our Google Hangout with Mike Calicrate. He is an independent cattle producer, business entrepreneur, and political activist. Welcome, Mike. I'm just going to say a few more words about you. Um, you have been actively involved in social and political efforts to improve the welfare of our family farmers and to restore effective publicly regulated markets. Uh, your innovative meat company, Ranch Foods Direct, uses uh, several humane handling uh, tactics, including mobile meat processing, which allows animals to be processed at the ranch and eliminates the stress of long distance hauling. Uh, Mike, uh, as uh, you well know, <laughs> and many of our audi audience members might know, um, was a recent uh, guest lecturer at the UC Berkeley Edible Education class. Uh, where he spoke about the rural, social, and cultural impacts of current economic trends in the farming industry. So Mike, thanks again. We're so happy that you're here and joining us for this Google Hangout. Thanks for having me. And we're also joined by two special guests, Catherine Kwanbeck, who is the project coordinator for Mendocino County's Economic Development and Finance Corporation. Welcome, Catherine. Thank you. And also Chelsea Lewis, uh, Senior Agricultural Development Coordinator at the Vermont Agency of Agriculture. Welcome, Chelsea. Thanks for having me. And I just wanted to add that um, Chelsea wanted to remind everyone that her statements that she makes today are just a, a reflection of her own opinion and not of the state of Vermont. So there is your disclaimer. I hope that. Thank you. Kind of like safe. So. Um, we have a few questions that we would love you all to uh, participate in answering. Uh, Mike, we'd love for you to lead in answering the questions, and uh, Catherine and Chelsea for you to join in as well. And uh, Stacy, if you'd like to yes. lead off. I would like to start um, by asking what the historical background to the changes that have occurred within our meat production and consumption patterns in the U.S. Um, what What is the background that has provided us to begin talking about the issues within the industrial meat system. You want me to start? Please. Uh, it just so happens, a really interesting article out today in the Washington Post. I know Michael uh, has seen it. Uh, he, he notified me that it was out. But this is an article that gives the history. It's called Obama's Game of Chicken. The untold story of how the administration tried to stand up to big ag companies on behalf of independent farmers and lost. And, and what this, what this uh, article talks about and what, what I've experienced in my lifetime is, is this whole focus on efficiency as opposed to fairness in the marketplace, as opposed to competitive markets that reward producers in a fair manner as well as give consumers choices and give consumers quality. Uh, and, and at, at affordable prices. It really started in the Chicago School uh, of Economics where Chicago School just was promoting the, the concept that big is better and that we should be focus on, focusing on efficiencies and economies of scale. And, and this permeated the, the, the land-grant universities that are out there as well as all the other colleges uh, that, that taught business. And so we really had this whole move towards what we call in our industry, chickenization. And it's the vertical integration from, from the producer all the way through the processor and now even into the retail stores. And it's gone so far at this point that now the retailers are so concentrated and so big that they are actually dictating totally from the top down to the producer as opposed to what used to happen 30 years ago with Big Meat Packer dictated in both directions to the producer as well as the consumer. In fact, in fact, this is the this is the behavior that we were really trying to correct a hundred years ago uh, when we when we had uh, the Teddy Roosevelt administration start to really address these uh, big trusts like the beef trust, the the uh, the oil trust, the banking trust, the railroad trust, the, the the big robber barons of that day. And of course I would argue that they're They've made a full return. Uh, the robber barons are now in business. They are dictating terms right on down to the very grassroots of those who produce our meat, our livestock, and our food. And so it's really been driven and supported by the Chicago schools mentality of efficiency and economies of scale. 
supply chain management. You've all heard those terms uh, being uh, promoted around over the last 30 years. And essentially, uh, what we've got today is is an economy uh, around food that really serves those at on the Wall Street level. Uh, those uh, at the at the very top, uh, at the investors are, are are doing well. Those who take the risk and, and provide the labor and capital are not doing so well. So contract ag today, in my view, uh, with this vertical integration and focus on efficiency over fairness is even worse. In, in the article, Obama's Game of Chicken that's out today talks about it's even worse than sharecropper status to those that are on the land. Mm. Uh, and, and so the, the other thing that I, that I see, you know, when we were in Berkeley, we talked about a little bit about the possibilities out there that, or, or the two, really, the two visions. Uh, we've, got, we've got the uh, industrial agriculture system which is prevailing today over over every other idea, and then we have the family farm system, and and the question being, can we reform and make this industrial system serve us? And of course, my my answer to that, after working in it for the last 37 years, is no, we can't really reform it. And I would be so radical as to say that we have to break it up. And, and we have to make room and clear the way and protect the model of agriculture that really does serve us well, and that's the family farm model. And so that's where we've been, and that's where we've come, and this is where we are, and we are in real trouble today in food, in food uh, production and distribution. It's affecting it, our environment in a, in a big time, in an environmentally negative way. Uh, it's wiping out our rural communities. It's putting people off the land at a wholesale rate. Uh, we have never had worse food on the plates of, of our consumers ever in our, you know, I believe, in human history. When you throw that high fructose corn syrup out there, the, you know, the, the MSG, the hydrogenated vegetable oil, we simply can't pay the bill when it comes to uh, the impact it's having on health. So uh, that's, that's where I see where we're at and how we got here. Thank you. Catherine or Chelsea, do you have anything to add? Sure, I can um, just talk a little bit. I work a lot with meat processors in Vermont, um, so I definitely see the effects that um, that Mike was talking about from the both the consolidation of the industry, so fewer players involved, um, and the concentration of the industry in places that are lower cost, so the Midwest and the Southeast, and that's happened over the past 50 years. Um, so that in Vermont, the number of small-scale slaughter facilities um, went from over 50 to now we have five. Um, and a lot of that is, is economics um, at, because of, of those economic forces that we saw nationally. Um, but I also wanted to touch on um, the point that, that Mike had made about um, retailer, retailer control. Um, it used to be that retailers would get in sides of beef and they'd cut it, cut it up in the shop and we had a lot more skilled meat cutters because that activity was happening at the retail level. Um, now I think because of the concentration those retailers are getting boxes of, of beef um, or other meat in and the only thing that folks at that um, generally at the retail level know how to do is cut those up into smaller portion sizes. Um, so we've had a real loss of, um, of skill both between having fewer um, meat processors and also because there used to be a lot of movement between the supermarket, between the market and between the slaughter facility. Now that cross training isn't happening because you take someone from a supermarket and put them into a slaughter facility and they have no idea. Um, they've never worked with a side of beef before. So I think that that's another conse consequence of that um, trend that, that Mike brought up. Interesting. Uh, Thank you, Catherine. Yeah, I would say you that um, both Mike and Chelsea have made some really good points, and uh, particularly on the kind of the business practices that have led us here, the um, economic policies, and then Chelsea, I absolutely hear what you're saying about retailer concentration and the changes in way the ways that re that meat is processed at the retail level. Um, and I would just also say that you know we've been the American public has has in the grand scheme of things. The, the thinking has been for the last 20, 30 years that we've benefited from this, right? Meat is really cheap, it's really plentiful, um, it's everywhere, 
there's a lot of convenience foods available, you know, lots of chicken nuggets and chicken patties and things that are quick and easy to cook. And I think we're finally starting to uh, come around to the idea that there are these hidden costs, and there's costs in terms of environmental damage, um, in terms of our own public, you know, public health and individual health of um, what eating these types of foods is doing to us, and and then some of the the associated social and economic costs in terms of labor and and job security and the, the kinds of jobs we've traded in. Um, what Chelsea was talking about, those are skilled jobs that were well paid, and we've traded in skilled jobs as a butcher for low-wage jobs in meat processing. Um, so I think there's definitely been some, some big societal changes over the last 40 to 50 years in the meat industry. Great. Chelsea, Thanks. what you were saying about, about the uh, lack of skills, and, and you, Catherine, as well, at Ranch Foods Direct here, we, we take it all the way from the live animal, which is processed in a mobile unit on the, on the ranch, and then we bring the carcasses up to Colorado Springs, about 200 miles away, and we cut them up into all the pieces, right down to burgers, steaks, and roasts, and, and value-added stuff. There is essentially no one left, uh, other, unless they're old. Our, our head butcher is 68 years old. He used to work in a slaughter plant and, and, and was put out of business by the big packers. Uh, back in the day of the heavy consolidation and con concentration, he didn't really realize what ha was happening to him until he looked back and saw that he just lost his markets and, and couldn't compete anymore. So this is interesting because Jerry, our head butcher, who I just described, is now teaching people to cut meat. And, and so we've really got a meat school here at Ranch Foods Direct. Yeah. And, and we've got young guys that come in that we teach them how to cut the animal up from the carcass all the way through, and it's really, really wonderful because they're able to earn a, a respectable wage doing that, and it's real work. It's work that's meaningful and, and, and should be paid a fair wage, and it's hard work. And, and so, but i got to tell you that we've got a lot of grocery stores around, Safeway, uh, Kroger, uh, Walmart, you know, the Costco's and all those that do not employ skilled workers. These are people, as exactly as Chelsea described, that are unskilled and low paid. And it gets worse when you get into the slaughter end of it, because these are really economic and war refugees from all around the world uh, that, that are now working in these slaughter facilities in very, very bad conditions. I also have um, just a positive story to share from Vermont. We recently um, created a skilled butcher and meat cutter um, apprenticeship program. So it's at Hannaford Career Center, which is um, on the western side of the state. Um, and they were fully enrolled this fall in their first semester um, with 11 students. And out of those 11 students, four of them already have jobs that they are um, at slaughter facilities and meat processing plants in Vermont um, that they're working at while they go through their coursework. Um, it's a two-year program, and the second year is an apprenticeship to try to really transfer that um, human capital that we have in these older, skilled butchers to the next generation. So it's really exciting to see that kind of um, that kind of interest from a younger generation. Um, and I should also mention that that was funded by the Vermont legislature. So um, really, commitment from the state level um, to to have that transfer of knowledge occur. Wow, that's great. Yeah, that's, that's really cool. And actually, um, if if we're ready to move on, I don't want to interrupt anybody. I'm, there's so much information to be shared here, but it it actually brings me to um, the next question, which is um, Chelsea, sort of what you were you were touching on. Um, what are levels of moderate change in policy and production that could make the meat industry more sustainable? Programs like like what you were talking about. So I, if you want me to go again, I, I can. Uh, uh, what, what I've got listed here is, is I think something that would really help us in building this new alternative food system. As Chelsea talked about, let's train these new butchers, but then we have to find them a job mm -hmm. in a business that can survive in an extremely predatory marketplace where you've got the Cisco's, the U.S. Foods, the, the biggest corporations in the, in the world coming after you. And, and, and keeping you from getting the business you need to be sustainable and, and to operate your business. And, and so what I would love to see is, 
is to, to see some more authentic buy local campaigns uh, across the country. And I'm not talking about the fake local campaigns. I'm talking about campaigns that are truly authentic to where people know to, to, to do business at these independent mom and pop kind of places, the, those places that really do create the wealth within the community and keep the money in the community through that, through that point of consumption. Uh, and we, we really need to, I think, talk to consumers uh, about how to find out where food comes from. Don't just go to a restaurant and based upon some buy locals uh, sign they've got out front. Ask them really, where does it come from? And when they say, well, it comes off the food service truck, well, wait a minute, where does it, what farm does it come from? And, and I think this is something that could really drive the business towards these new enterprises that will employ the butchers that, that Chelsea and her folks have, have been training. Uh, and and the, other, the other thing I, I, I think would help a lot is, is in school lunch, we have the local preference rule uh, to where a small company like myself can compete against the big companies in selling to the school lunch program because I can be higher priced and still get the, get the bid. And they can put the request uh, 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 for a proposal, the RFP out, and and I can be in a with a different product at a different price level. I can still get the business. Of course, they've got to have the money to pay for it, but, but at least we have the opportunity to get in there. We should do a lot more local preference stuff, and we should do this at city levels, county government levels. And so, if a city has has a golf, a, a couple of golf courses, or perhaps they've got a uh, a cafe or a cafeteria in in one of their one of their office buildings. Buy local. Make sure that these companies are buying local and and not not getting around it in any way. The other thing uh, we're we're talking about building a a year round public market here in Colorado Springs, like the Ferry Market, the, the the Pike Place Market, the Milwaukee Market, those kind of places. Really bring back those old markets from a hundred years ago that used to serve these urban centers, but build a protective district around it and make it fairly large. Perhaps it's, it's over the city in, in some cases, depending on the size of the city, but for sure over a district within the city that protects it from what I call big food, big food being your national chains and, and all of those that really support industrial agriculture. You know, big food being, or, or companies that, that really do uh, source from industrial agriculture. And, and the other thing I believe we, we ought to be doing is supporting some honest, humane animal treatment uh, type of production systems. There's a lot of false images that are being thrown out there right now, like with the United States Farmers and Ranchers Alliance. Many of the big corporations today are falsely claiming uh, that, they're, that they've got humane uh, practices in their, in their sourcing. But the problem is that they're only sourcing a very small part of what they're actually marketing through some of these uh, programs, uh, and the others just coming out of these big these big uh, companies. So the other the other thing that's a no brainer, Obama promised to do it, is let's ban big meat packer ownership of livestock, get it back in the hands of family farmers, and with that bring back some competitive market. That's a big job, but Obama promised to do it in his campaign in 2008. He did absolutely nothing to, to promote that, as, as Obama's Game of Chicken the article says today. We need real country of origin labeling, and we need it on everything from, from the retail level all the way through wholesale. You ought to be able to go to a, into a McDonald's, a Burger King, any restaurant in the country and find out where the food came from. That way we can support local. Or, or we can support global, and we've got to at least have a choice. And, and so I'd, I'd love to see, the other thing is I'd love to see this administration uh, re, uh, take another run at these gypsy rules. Uh, we've got to live a little different view uh, of, of what we expect as citizens in this country after this election. We need fair markets. Let's, bring, let's, let's get those gypsy rules enforced. And for who, though, if you read this Obama's Game of Chicken, it really focuses on those gypsy rules. The other thing... Uh, Chelsea, that you, you probably can talk a little bit about too, is we've made regulations for the small packers so onerous that they can't compete. And basically what USDA has done 
is they have taken inspection away. Uh oh. Oh no. Oh, I think we just lost Mike. Oh no. Um, well, hopefully he'll be back on in just a second. Um, but Chelsea and, and Catherine, maybe you can um, respond. I know Mike was talking quite a bit about, well, I guess he was talking about the pack, meat packing, uh, but also the, the um, Obama administration. I think it would be interesting to hear if you all, um, your thoughts on, you know, what you think could potentially happen with um, the administration and, you know, potential changes there as well. Yeah. I, I mean, I feel like there's a lot of potential there. There's, um, you know, you've got some some acts uh, represented. Let's see, Pingree and Brown have the Local Food, Local Farms, Local Jobs Act, I believe it's called. And, you know, maybe now that the election's finally over, we'll get some movement on the farm bill and kind of see what happens there. And, and speaking as somebody who formerly worked at USDA, I feel like there's been a real change there. Um, I started there in 2007 and left in 2000. Uh, 11 actually, and really saw a lot of change in terms of support for local foods and sustainable agriculture and the, the Know Your Farmer, Know Your Food initiative has been just, I feel really successful at the agency and I, I think there's some genuine um, interest in, in supporting some more sustainable, more uh, regional approaches to food systems. Um, oh, great, it looks like Mike's about to join us again. Hello Mike. <laughs> okay, I'm back. You're back. <laughs> We're, we're glad you're back. Um, so, uh, yeah. So, uh, when, at what point did you lose me? We <laughs> lost you when you were just starting to talk about uh, meat packing and, and and talking to Chelsea directly about that. Regulation. Oh, about the HACCP stuff. And, I, and what I talked about is is we have made inspection uh, in these small plants so onerous that a lot of them simply can't afford it. Uh, they can't afford the updates. They, you know, these are perfectly safe plants that, that have produced have been producing safe meat. For very for a very long time, and and what USDA has done with, with actually USDA has been taken over by the big packers. They write the rules at USDA from inspection to to uh, competition rules with gypsa and all of that. And and so what they've done is they've made it very easy on themselves. And the big packers have removed inspection from the big plants and and really turned inspection towards the small plants in a very harassing way. What I would do is I would revoke HACCP. I would forget HACCP and I would put in place a real inspection system to where people are back in these packing plants with authority. They can slow these, these fast chains down that are killing an animal every eight and a half to nine seconds at 350 to 400 head a, a, an hour uh, and, 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 and protect these workers. We'll have a lot fewer energy it, it, injuries and we will have a much safer, cleaner product go into the consumer. Plus, we will enable the small meat packing facility to reopen, and with that better inspection system, we will also have better access to the marketplace within our communities. If USDA will do their job of stopping the predatory practices of these bigger companies. So I can speak a little bit to um, to regulations for for small meat processors. Um, I was actually surprised when I was doing research um, in New England. I surveyed all of the slaughter facilities, federally and state inspected slaughter facilities um, in the six New England states. And of all of their challenges, HACCP actually ranked at the bottom. Um, I was also under the impression that the regulations were really onerous and that they were struggling. Um, but they actually found that that the, that wasn't a major problem for them. Um, not to say I definitely agree. Things like um, validation and nutrition labeling, things will come down the pike that will be um, much harder for a small scale or small scale plant to comply with than a large scale plant, um, just because the number of employees and not being able to have someone who can um, monitor that full time, um, it, c it can be a challenge. Um, but overall, what we're hearing um, that more of it beyond kind of the regulatory framework, a real concern for both um, mostly small scale producers is regulatory literacy. So just understanding the regulations because they are they are very complex. Um, we've actually found, I've found the USDA regulations to have a lot of um, exemptions for small scale producers that are fairly flexible, um, surprisingly flexible. Um, and there are ways for producers to kind of operate outside of the commercially inspected um, facilities through a series of different exemptions. Um, but I don't think that those exemptions are very well understood. Um, 
So what we're doing in Vermont is trying to, um, we've created this regulatory literacy guide that's a flowchart through all of the different ways that you can get your meat to market. Um, sometimes, you know, based on your scale and your stage of development, it really does make sense to get into a commercially inspected slaughter facility, but if you're just doing a few animals a year and you can sell them as live animals, maybe you can go to a custom shop. Um, you know, may, it, there's, there may be some ways to get around um, that, that commercially inspected route. Mm -hmm. So that's the approach that we've been taking, um, and it, it seems to have some good response here. Yeah. And, and Chelsea, it's important, I think, to note that PASIP is not required in the small plants. If you're a custom plant, if you're a state inspected local locker plant, it's not it's not required. And boy, would I love to, to get those locker plants up and going yeah. to where they're serving that community and, and providing those farmers better access for custom business. Because that, I mean, that's the, as good as it can get. It, it, if you can sell directly to your neighbor, it, that and, and back in that country, back in your country, you got a lot more neighbors. Yeah, like, that, that would be a that would be just a, a, a terrific thing to see happen. Is is just a lot more custom stuff and people buying from those who they they know. Yeah, we're do, we're doing a lot of work trying to get those custom shops up and running. And just to clarify, something you said there is, um, in Vermont, we do have state inspection, which is a commercial inspection that's equal to USDA inspection. So that was is a policy change that we would love to see. Right now, even though the rules are exactly the same, if you have if you have a state inspected facility, the meat can't cross um, state lines. So we that's something that we've been working on in the last however many five farm bills. Um, and every year, I think they get a little bit closer to um, making that that work. But we'd really love to see folks who are getting their meat processed at a Vermont state inspected facility, which again, following all the same rules as federal, um, if they'd be able to ship that um, across state lines to the bigger cities of New York and Boston. But Chelsea, yeah. at the same time as your local people can't ship across the state line, Uruguay has full access. Yeah. That's nice. <laughs> well, I'll have to keep our keep our eye on Ohio. I think Ohio is the uh, pilot project for FSIS to take a look at that and see if um, how that works of kind of making state inspection truly equal to, to federal inspection. And one other thing that I would add from my experience here in, in Mendocino County, I'm in Northern California in a, a fairly rural part of California, and our project here is we're working on trying to build a meat processing facility. So. Um, we would love to be at the stage where you're at, Mike, and have a, a facility that was open and operating. And, and what, from, from the perspective of somebody who's trying to build one of these plants, it, it doesn't seem the regulatory burden is something we will get to. We would love to get to that stage. But our issues right now are um, operating costs and seasonality issues. And I'm sure you, you all face this as well. But um, you kind of touched on this, Mike, when you were saying the, the environment that small plants, the um, sort of the competition for small plants and, and our costs for production are just so much higher. I mean, I, um, I've heard that the large packing houses can uh, process a head of beef for about five, uh, 50 bucks and we're looking at, we would have to charge a rancher somewhere between 500 to 700 dollars a head by the time you count in your, your kill fee and your cost of cut and wrap. And so you can see how that, pa that really gets passed through in the meat and um, the cost of the meat. And so we've been really struggling with cost of production and, you know, can we even develop a plan for a viable business that could get to the stage of being inspected, let alone, you know, how will we deal with those inspections when we get there? Um, uh, so Catherine, it, it, it's true that the, the big meat, or, meat packer can kill an animal for that, but is it that, that, does, yeah. that does not include the value added. That, that only puts out a box of beef. Yep. It still has to be cut up. So, you know, you know we charge in our meat slaughter operation, we charge $65 a head to kill it. And then we charge about 68 cents a pound based on the carcass weight mm -hmm. to, to put it in a, a freezer wrap or package that's con, that's consumable. And, yeah. and so, but you're right about that $500 number. Uh, yeah. But still, when you consider how much money that consumer is spending today at Walmart, mm -hmm. you can you can compete with that by cutting out the middlemen and, and getting that profit that 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 margin back where it belongs, and that's at, at the level of production and, and the small processing plant. There, there. The, I, I can show you those numbers, but it's we can we can with, be within three cents of a Walmart store uh, on the price per pound, and 
I'll bet you aren't going to pump 12% solution into that product, along with the phosphates, the flavoring agents, and, and the meat tenderization that it will require as well. So, yeah, we, I think I'd love, to, I'd love to work with you on your, on your project out there, and, and we'll get, help you. We certainly I, have the market. I, I, got, I got all the numbers for you. So. <laughs> oh, good. And, that, and that's what the meat packers hate about me, is, is I do have the numbers. And, and they can't get away with this idea that, hey, we're in the red. We never make money. And, of course, then they announce at the end of the year that they've made a 17% profit or a return on equity. Yeah. And, that's, and that doesn't include the retailer equity, return on equity of 21% for the last six years. So uh, there, there's, there's plenty of money in the deal. We just have to make sure that we're dealing directly with the consumer so that it can go where it needs to go. Right. So the money gets into the right hands. That's right. Yeah. And I'd actually like to address um, consumer education and um, how we can teach consumers about their choices and what steps, what moderate steps at least, could be taken to start making a change in the way people, you know, consider buying meat and also just how to change their habits, eating habits. Well, I think to start with, let's let's have a whole lot of viewing parties of, for Food Inc. Uh, <laughs> that changes people when when they see that film. That changes people. And I've got a nephew that lives up at uh, uh, Eagle, Colorado, up in the mountains, and he saw Food Inc. a couple of years ago. And so he went to his class that fall, and, and he made sure that every kid in his class saw the movie. And some of them watched it together. But what was interesting is is none of those kids are eating fast food now. Now he's got his second class that he has done this with. And so he's got two classes that, that don't eat fast food. And, and if, if they forget, they, re, they view the movie again. But, but the thing I think you need in combination with that is, is a discussion about what the alternatives are. And, you know, I, I fought for years litigating big packers and trying to legislate better laws to where family farmers got a, a, a fair deal. But at the same time, you can talk about how broken the food system is, but you, if you don't have an alternative you can talk about, it, it really doesn't give people a choice of, of, of how to make it better. And, and so that's why I get excited about the alternative food stuff and rent my, what I work on most every single day is, is trying to build that alternative food system. And once consumers see it, taste it, experience it, then they become salespeople for you. I mean, last week, the numbers are on the wall behind me. We were up 31% over last year. And last year was up 26% over the year before that. But th this is really amazing when people figure it out and, and they tell each other. So they become a real sales force for you. But, but I think Food Inc. is the most important film in the last 100 years uh, when it, it related to food. And, and, and what's wrong with the system, but we need to focus, now we need to talk about what the alternatives are. Absolutely. Anybody else want to speak to that? Chelsea, go ahead. Sure. <laughs> um, no, I couldn't agree more that um, it's an issue not just of consumer education and demand, but um, of making it accessible. Um, and that's something we talk a lot about here um, in Vermont, where we have so many big urban centers so close um, to where we are along the eastern seaboard. How do we get our local Vermont meat to those um, to those consumers? So I think that I think they want it. I think that they've you know they've heard the story. They they want an alternative. Um, so now we just have to get it to them. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of food hub activity in Vermont, which is very exciting, and that kind of is serving the, the local market. Um, but now we're talking with some larger distributors. Um, Black River Produce is a really great distributor in Vermont um, that distributes regionally. They're doing, last year they did over $5 million in local meat sales. So, you know, for a small state like Vermont, we're 600,000 people. Um, that's that's a fairly good amount of, of meat. Um, and now they're building their own processing space so that they can do portion cutting and really ramp that up. Um, they see local meat as a huge growth um, area for their business. So they're really committed to growing that that part and getting that more of that to, um, to other markets throughout the East Coast. Um, something else that we're working on and which I'm really excited about um, is 
a Know Your Processor campaign. Mm -hmm. So I think um, we're really lucky right now that consumers are both interested in local food, but also there's this like rock star butcher thing going on. Mm -hmm. um, hasn't really reached back to the traditional meat processor yet. Um, people don't still, I think, don't really like to think about the slaughter facility. So, but is there a way to kind of heighten the respect um, for the people who are doing that work in the actual slaughter and processing facility without turning the consumer off by kind of capitalizing on both the local food movement um, and the butcher thing? So that people kind of really think about that that profession, um, and then maybe even pay a little bit more, um, pass some of that money not only back to the producer but to the processor, um, so that they can have you know higher quality of life. Um, some research that we've done on the pro on the producer side is that environmental sustainability and producer livelihoods are really two drivers for um, consumers. So if we can really ca capitalize on that, on those themes and say, listen, these processors are doing an incredibly hard job. Um, I think managing a slaughter facility is the hardest job in the food system. Um, you know, you have someone over your shoulder th all day um, watching what you're doing. They could shut you down at any minute. Um, you have 200, more than 200 um, producers who want their meat all cut a different way. Um, you have employees who maybe you can't afford to pay that much. So. Um, Maybe they aren't showing up to work all the time. It's um, it's a really challenging profession, and I think there are things that we can do to um, to get more money back into that phase of this the value chain um, and heighten the respect for those folks. So Chelsea, I'll, I'll put a webcam in my cutting room. So Great. So people <laughs> can it. see these young guys. These are really. <laughs> These are these are really great guys, <laughs> cool. and they do, and they totally deserve respect. Uh, they they are. This is hard work. Yeah, it, it is. is real. It's real. It's real work. Yeah, uh, yeah. I have this image in my head of like a bunch of um, slaughter facility workers with their USDA plant inspection number and holding their inspection number, so that you have like their face and their inspection number, so you make that connection between the number and the and the facility. So yeah. we'll see. Any way we can bring more awareness about the work that they do. Those are great. Those are great ideas. I, I'm picturing a calendar with like processor of the month. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, these. I, that's really exciting to hear. I mean, you guys have got a lot of a lot of great projects going on. And um, one of the things we were t I was thinking through some of these questions earlier about um, what consumers can do. And 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 Mike, you definitely touched on this of like getting out of the traditional grocery store, right? There's really good food to be found at farmer's markets and at local butcher shops and through CSAs and some of the non-traditional um, venues. And I, I love hearing about, um, Chelsea, about some of your projects working with distributors because one of the struggles I see with farmer's markets, while there's really great products there, everything still falls back on the farmer, right? So the farmer has to not, or the farmer or the rancher has to not only raise the animal, but they have to go and get it processed and they have to select how it should be cut and then they have to be the salesperson and the marketing person. And seeing some of these things that, that both of you are doing with, um, mar with processing and marketing, that shifts that some of that burden off of the producers so that they're not the only one who are who's uh, responsible through the entire supply chain until until it gets to consumers so I think there's some some really exciting stuff going on with aggregation and processing and distribution and then um, ha finding consumers to be more aware of those steps in the supply chain that food isn't produced at the grocery store that it has to get there somehow and where it comes from and, and if a consumer knows to ask when they go to a restaurant where does the food come from it really facilitates that process or looking to those farmers yeah. for supply. Mm -hmm. There's nothing more powerful than a eater going into a restaurant and asking where the food comes from and then if the answer is wrong, walking out. Thank, and thanking them and giving them a, a, a little money for the glass of water perhaps, but, but really just making a statement. And if that happens once or twice in a week, I mean these guys are thinking pretty hard about what in the world's going on. And, and so that, that to us is, is the biggest deal. Our, we put out a newsletter every month for, with Ranch Foods Direct to about seven to 8,000 people. And these are all advocates. They become advocates for, for the food system. And so that's something else that we can look at doing. I love that Fix Food website. We need a lot more of that kind of stuff. A place that people can go and really trust what they're, what they're seeing. Absolutely. And you can see it not only on people 
um, walking out of restaurants or, or retailers that don't meet their standards, but you see it of them walking into places that do. So look at the growth in Chipotle, right? I mean, Chipotle opens something like three new stores a week, and that's really... Um, it's not that tacos and burritos were that unique. There's a lot of places that sell tacos and burritos, but they have done such a good job of really meeting the demands of customers who are looking for, you know, in the words of their campaign, food with integrity, and people want to know where their food comes from. And so it's, it's choosing those locations, and they're able to charge a premium for those products. Wonderful. Um, well, I, I, we are wrapping up here, but I, I don't know if anyone, Mike, if you had anything else you wanted to add, or Chelsea, or, or Catherine? I don't have anything else. Just really appreciate this opportunity. Yeah. This, is, this, is, this is how we get this done, I think, uh, this, this new alternative food system, how to build and support it. Absolutely. It's really been awesome to have all of you. You all have such unique perspectives, and you can tell you, you're in agreement on the most important parts of these things, but you're all doing your individual in your individual ways making huge differences and um, we're honored that you joined us today and so thrilled that you could so take the time so thank you all so much um, we really appreciate it and I just wanted to add one thing for anybody who is watching that um, this Google Hangout can, is available always um, on playback on our YouTube channel and that's youtube.com slash ESY project as well as on our website ediblesschoolyear.org um, and uh, also, uh, Mike, your lecture was recorded, and that is available on both of those uh, websites as well. So I encourage anybody who wants to hear even more from Mike to, to watch that. It was an excellent lecture, and we learned so much. So again, um, thank, thank you, you all. all. We hope to see you again. And if you're ever interested in joining us for another Google Hangout, you should. <laughs> um, we'd love it. Thanks, Thanks so for having us. Thanks for having Thanks. us. Take care, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.